welcome to Casually Criterion, the off week episode. Uh, my name is Justin, and usually at this point you'd be hearing Chris's voice, but Chris is not with us this week. He is gone. He is in a play, and he'll probably not be here for the next couple of weeks. But in lieu of Chris, we have special guest Mike. Hello. You might recognize Mike from the last couple of episodes, and I guess now is as good a time as any to announce that Mike will be joining the podcast permanently. Hooray! Um, yeah, we, we liked having three people. I thought it was it was a little bit more of a dynamic conversation, and I think Mike enjoyed his time here, so we're, we're going to do it forever now. Yeah, and we're going to start off by having an episode with two people to <laughs> right. celebrate adding a third person as a yeah. regular host. <laughs> thanks, Chris. Yeah, thanks yeah. a lot. Break a leg. Cool. If you want to follow along with the show, see what's going on, see when Chris might be back or you know, yell at Chris for not being here. Uh, you can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash casually criterion podcast. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at casual criterion, or you can just email us directly at casually criterion at gmail.com. And don't forget to give us a review on iTunes. Uh, that helps us grow the show, helps us get listeners. We, we really want to do listener interaction things. We have segments like our top three. We want to, you know, I think it'd be fun to have listeners suggested top three. Absolutely. And, all right. And for a rundown of today's show, first thing we're going to do our news and uh, movie news segment or what's on our mind, that sort of stuff. And we're going to talk about the Golden Globes in that and probably a couple of other things. And then for our big discussion this week, we're going to be reviewing and talking about two films. Uh, first one will be A Ghost Story by David Lowry. And the second will be Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri by Martin McDonough. Am I pronouncing that right? Is I, it McDonough? I think so. That's how I've always said it. That's how I'm going to say it from now on for the rest of the show. All right. Cool. And then, we'll, of course, we'll do our top three at the end of all of that. So first thing, Mike, do you want to tell us what's on your mind and movie news, whatever it is that you've got? Sure. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we actually did a top five uh, of our favorite either TV shows or movies that we watched all year. And at the time, uh, we had a lot of franchise and sequels and things like that on the top li- top five lists. And uh, this past couple weeks has actually been a really great time for movies. And within the last couple weeks, I've actually watched like four movies that could have easily been on the top five of the year. Uh, I'll just name a couple because we might actually end up talking about some of these later on on the podcast. The one I, I watched most recently that I wanted to talk about was called Call Me By Your Name. Have you heard of this movie? I've heard of, but uh, not really anything about it other than uh, whatever like brief synopsis is. That's like It's like two, a two-sentence synopsis is basically all I've read, so I feel like I don't know much about it. Right. Well, it would be a coming-of-age gay romance story, and it's actually from the director, uh, Luca Guadagnino? I'm not sure, but he directed I Am Love with Tilda Swinton. Have you ever seen that? Oh, I have seen that. It's been a long time. That movie came out quite a while ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, this is his newest movie. Army Hammer's in this movie. Army Hammer from Social Network fame and Lone Ranger fame, or maybe not fame. But, uh, yeah, Yeah. he's quite good in this. Uh, This is probably the best movie that I've seen him in, except for maybe Social Network, which I'm not sure if I like better or not. Yeah, I was going to ask if he – I thought he was one of the twins. Oh, he played both of the twins, right? Yeah, yeah, he played both of uh, the Winklevoss twins or something like that. I can't remember. But, yeah, he's very good in this, and I think uh, you should give it a shot. Coming of age, gay romance. Yeah, I plan to, and I was actually – uh, intrigued because I was looking at the Golden Globe nominations, which we'll get to in a second. But the uh, the kid that is the other guy that's in it was it Timothy Chalamet? I want to say his name is. Mm-hmm. Um, he's also in Lady Bird, which I watched recently. Oh yeah, me and too. He's really good in Lady Bird. So I, when I found out that that kid was in it, also uh, made me even more excited to see this one. Absolutely, Lady Bird was another movie that uh, I watched recently, which would probably also have been on a top five. Yeah, I think it would have definitely been on mine, too. Uh, my movie news, I recently bought the DVD uh, Criterion Collection version of Armageddon. Nice. 
yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't fully watched it yet, uh, but there were a couple of things that I noticed. I, and one being that like the DVD menu is really, really terrible. Really? <laughs> like, it's it's really weird to look at like that being a Criterion movie and having such an awful DVD menu. Like, I, I don't know. That it really weirded me out and like caught me off guard. I don't know if I've not watched any other uh, DVD Criterions from like that time, uh-huh. but it seemed exceptionally bad and it just kind of threw me off. That I don't would, know. Have you seen this menu? I haven't seen the menu, but I'm familiar with that cover for that one and The Rock. Those were kind of in the early days of the Criterion DVDs, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Armageddon's like number 40. The Rock's like number 100 and something, I think, like early 100s. So oh, my. The Rock's not that early. Well, most but Armageddon's pretty early on. Most of those old ones that we've watched by now have ended up having re-releases. So... I guess it's quite possible that maybe it was the standard for old Criterions to not have particularly good menus. I think I remember the original Seven Samurai from the blockbuster we used to work at. That menu, I remember being pretty blah. And the cover was pretty blah back in the day, too. So yeah. I think it took them a few years to find their groove. Yeah, I think I think so, and they, I'll just say they definitely didn't seem to hit it with the presentation of the Armageddon <laughs> DVD. <laughs> but the the big thing that I, I guess I really want to talk about that I think is kind of amazing is there's a, a commentary track on it, uh-huh. uh, and it's uh, Michael Bay, Jerry Bruckheimer, uh, Ben Affleck, and Bruce Willis. Oh my! And they're not all they're not all together. They're recording separately, so it just kind of you just hear one talking at a time. Oh right! And kind of cutting between like their different commentaries, but it's actually really amazing. Like it's, it might be one of my favorite DVD commentaries I've ever listened to. <laughs> and I, I don't know what, I didn't necessarily expect that. I had heard that it was like kind of entertaining, but I, I don't know. What, what would you expect? Would you expect that? Oh man. From that lineup of, uh, Bruce Willis, Ben Affleck, Jay Bruckheimer, and Michael Bay, I would expect the most macho, uh, testosterone fueled DVD commentary that I could imagine. Um, yeah, and it's probably good that they weren't in the same room together because I can imagine those guys just breaking out in a fight. Yeah, I, I wonder <laughs> what would have happened if they had been together because like Ben Affleck just spends the whole time like kind of trashing the movie and like kind of making fun of it for different different points. Like, probably a way to he, save face because he had his ear to the ground and kind of knew what people were saying about the movie. Yeah, probably so. But there, there's just stuff like he asks uh, Michael Bay like, why is it why is it easier to train oil drillers to become astronauts than astronauts to learn how to drill a hole in a rock <laughs> and uh just makes fun of it like in, in that kind of way and and yeah. i don't know it, it's it's super entertaining to listen to ben affleck but it's also like really entertaining to get a like a peek into the mind of michael bay right <laughs> right like like what is that guy's process like what does he think about when he's when he's uh, like making a shot or like deciding on like the set direction or like the costumes or, right. you know, whatever, like what is he thinking about? Yeah. What does a guy like, like that even begin to think about when approaching, like planning out a movie? Yeah. I, and that's yeah. fascinating to me. <laughs> so that, that's probably like just, even though Ben Affleck's like stuff was fun and like, it's funny to hear someone just make fun of Armageddon a lot. Like sure. the Michael Bay stuff was like the most interesting thing. I was like, I didn't expect to be entertained by listening to that guy talk about movie making. I never even thought to myself, like, I would like to listen to a Michael Bay commentary before. But now that you mention it, yeah, you, I, you uh, should, I don't not want to hear it. Yeah, you should do it. And, and I guess to briefly mention Jerry Bruckheimer, like, he's just in love with Michael Bay and everything that Gross. they're doing in that movie. <laughs> so <laughs> you get to hear, opposite of Ben Affleck, you get to hear someone, like, praise the movie and Michael Bay endlessly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Bruce Willis is, is, seems like maybe the most boring person on earth because like all he does is just kind of state what's happening on screen yeah. most of the time and then just never really comment on it <laughs> he's just like oh yeah this is this is the scene where we actually get to walk up onto the ship i don't remember why and then he leaves it at that i don't remember why i am actually thinking about this right now but i remember the wedding crashers commentary vince vaughn and owen wilson just talk about the game they saw that day and they go like 30 minutes without talking about the movie at all that's funny. Yeah, so it got it, it's got to be better than that. All yeah. right. Well, I I just I recommend the Armageddon DVD commentary. It's 
it's a great watch. Maybe probably the best thing that exists on that, like on that DVD. Yeah. I'm not, I haven't watched all the special features, but well, you've certainly, it's certainly better than the movie. Yeah. You certainly made me come closer to wanting to watch Armageddon again more than I have been, uh, probably in, I guess almost 20 years now. Cool. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to do it pretty soon on the, the, yeah, the criterion true. episodes. You're, we're not that far away from it. So you're going to have to watch it again, regardless. That's true. But I might watch it twice once with commentary and once without good idea. Okay. Um, so you want to talk about golden globe winners now? Yeah, let's do that. So I guess we'll just pick out a few, uh, of, interesting. Of the key top, it, ones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not going to go one by one. That would be excruciating, probably. Yeah. Um, so I guess we'll start best screenplay and also won best uh, drama, best motion picture drama. And that was three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, and Martin McDonough won for best screenplay. And I don't Do you have any thoughts on that? I am happy he won. However... As much as I like this movie, and we'll get into this later, I kind of wish he had gotten just more recognition for his first movie, which I find to be better, which is In Bruges. Um, but I'm glad he won. I, uh, I'm i happy to see an original screenplay like this one uh, get so much attention and praise in a time where uh, I feel like that is not necessarily sought after or valued. How about you? Uh, out of the list of, I, I haven't seen most of the films that are on there, but I have seen Lady Bird, um, t- to which I think I prefer Lady Bird as a movie, but I can see how the script would be. Sure. This is a little more ambitious. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd say, I think that like, I'm not so sold on it winning like best drama. I think I haven't seen many of the, the drama ones either, but I, I certainly will get into it, I guess, but I am more impressed in some ways by like the screenplay than I am the actual finished product of the film, but we can get into that <laughs> later. Yeah, no, I, I can see that. I think maybe uh, the script is better than he directed it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And so best director was another one. This was kind of a, a big deal, or at least I saw a lot of people posting about it on Facebook that I, I wouldn't expect to really care about this guy, but Guillermo del Toro won for The Shape of Water. Yeah, that's which interesting. I, I have not seen this one. Have, have you? I have. Uh, I have seen The Shape of Water, and I preferred it to like the last three, I think, Guillermo del Toro movies. Uh, what were his last three? Cause I've, oh, goodness. You, Pacific Rim, I saw. Yeah, I, the, the Pacific I Rim, I do not like. Uh, Crimson Peak, I thought was meh. And Hellboy 2, The Golden Army. So out of all three of those movies, I would say I definitely think Shape of Water fits more in with um, his earlier stuff, like maybe Devil's Backbone or Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah, I got that vibe from the the trailer, which I've seen the trailer probably like 15 times. I feel like that thing's been around for forever. Yeah, and I think this movie probably would be better not knowing anything about it, but that ship has sailed, obviously. Yeah, that's impossible. But, at least uh, yeah, at this see point. It. it's good. Guillermo del Toro is part of the Criterion Collection, actually. He's got like his trilogy on there, uh, Devil's Backbone, Pan's Labyrinth, and um, whatever, Kronos. Kronos. And we're a long ways away from watching any of those movies, so I imagine we'll probably watch Shape of Water pretty soon and talk about... That'll be the, like, the next uh, del Toro film that we talk about. Yeah, I'd be excited um, about that because I would be interested to hear some more thoughts and opinions. I guess it would briefly best actor um, in a comedy was James Franco for the disaster artist, which uh, I don't know how you feel about that, but I kind of, I kind of think that, or I'm kind of put off sometimes, or I guess skeptical of a performance when it feels sort of like an impression the whole time. Right. Yeah. I, uh, I thought the same thing when I was actually watching the disaster artist. I remember thinking if I didn't know who Tommy was, so was, I would think this was a terrible performance. Uh, yeah, that's it's kind of the way. And maybe he deserves some credit for writing that line. Yeah, yeah, maybe so. I mean, it's definitely good. It's not a bad performance. But no. I'm with you in the sense that, like, I don't know if 
best actor in a comedy. Like, I would prefer to see, like, you know, maybe like something like The Big Sick get some more love instead of instead of the disaster artist myself. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then best actress in a musical comedy went to uh, Sersha Ronan. And I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. I looked it up before we did this. It's close, if it's not right. It's yeah, better than I could do. Yeah, Saoirse, Saoirse Ronan for Lady Bird, uh, which I'm on board with. I like this one. Yeah. It makes sense to me. I think that girl is delightful, and I've been a fan of hers since, like, Atonement. This was, I think, the first time I saw her. Yeah, and, same. Uh, I think we saw that together for the first yeah, time. we did. And, um, yeah, she's great. I thought she was really good in Hannah as well. And right. the past couple oh, man, years, I forgot about that one. Yeah, that's a good movie. And for the past couple years, she's just been on a roll. She did a movie a couple years ago called Brooklyn that I remember seeing and thought was delightful. All right. And we'll go on to the drama acting ones. Best actor in a drama was Gary Oldman for Darkest Hour, which I have not seen. Have you? No, I have not. Cool. Then. I guess we probably don't have much to say about it. I no. assume he's good. Gary I... Oldman's generally pretty good. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Gary Oldman likes to deliver. So I imagine that it is a well-acted, competent piece of work. Okay, and then Best Actress in a Drama was Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Again, Frances McDormand won for that one. Hmm. And I guess she she's won awards for before for Fargo, right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, I think she, I think she did. And um, so I guess this is not her first time to win, but it, in some ways I guess it's been so long and – She's been doing so much. I kind of felt like I had a sense that initially I was like, oh, it's about time she gets recognized. Yeah, it's been 20 years since Fargo, and she hasn't exactly been everywhere since then. No, but I, I feel like she has, I guess, because she's in – maybe I just watch Fargo a lot. And, yeah, and burn and after like, reading. Burn after reading a ton. and um, I feel like she's just – I feel like she's been doing stuff and just hasn't been in the awards conversation at all. So this felt like a finally to me, but I guess she did win a long time ago. And I, I haven't seen any of these other films, but this one seems fitting to me. Yeah, no, she uh, made me cry in this movie. Oh. There's a, there's a scene in this movie, which we'll talk about later, but uh, I thought she just nailed it. Oh, she was in uh, Almost Famous also and Moonrise Kingdom. Yeah. yeah, I've certainly watched Almost Famous a ton in the, within the last 20 years, too. So. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of non Coen Brothers movies that Frances McDormand has been in. She has had a career outside of the Coen Brothers. All right, so uh, the two best picture categories, we already talked about Three Billboards winning for drama, and so uh, musical or comedy best picture went to Lady Bird. Yay. And I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I really enjoyed Lady Bird. I thought it was uh, really good, kind of a simple story like it it's not wholly original like a kid you know living through their senior year and like all that like teen angst and there's like potential of like losing your virginity and all this stuff like fighting with mom wanting to go Mm -hmm. to a college growing pains yeah coming of age i guess Mm -hmm. is the like the simpler way to put all of that but like it didn't really feel like wholly original from any of those like stories but just really well made and like all the details and it it felt unique definitely it feels genuine Greta Gerwig uh this is her first movie that she's directed and usually she's just an awesome actress but uh it turns out she's an awesome director too she's really good at getting I don't know the performance the performances that uh she was able to get I don't yeah I, I, I really dig it yeah it's a good movie it's it's understated it's quiet it doesn't it doesn't try to do too much, but it's totally comfortable and confident in what it is doing. And uh, I think it's really, really good. Yep. I agree. And I, I guess this actually, I've seen more of these films, and I don't think I liked any of the other films that were nominated. Uh, I, Tanya, Disaster Artist, Get Out. I actually haven't seen The Greatest Showman, but I've seen the other three. And out of those five, I definitely think Lady Bird deserves it. Yeah, I think so too. Out of those, I would prefer Lady Bird. Definitely, for sure. I guess that does it for movie news and hmm. whatnot. So do you want to move on and talk about a ghost story? Let's do it. When I was little, and we used to move all the time. I'd write these notes, and I would fold them up really small. 
and I would hide them. What did they say? They were just like things I wanted to remember so that if I ever wanted to go back, there'd be a piece of me there waiting. So before we actually start this movie, I wanted to go ahead and just say that we are going to do full spoilers for both A Ghost Story and Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri, because we assume if you're listening to this, you've probably already seen those movies. Yeah. No spoiler free. Ness, we're, we're going to ruin it. Okay. So A Ghost Story was directed by David Lowry, who I believe he did Pete's Dragon is his biggest movie. Mm-hmm. Did you see that? And I didn't actually. I've heard it was really good from uh, from some friends who saw it. It's it's solid. It's a good movie. It's fine. Yeah, and I, actually, this is the first movie of his that I've seen. I've heard of the other ones. I've been meaning to see for a long time. Uh, Ain't them bodies saints was kind of the big one that he kind of broke onto the scene with. I think mm-hmm. I never saw that either. Yeah, seems to like I Rooney Mara. Good. Yeah, is she in that? Mm-hmm. Okay, but I did not know that. And Ghost Story, I guess, it's a story of a guy who dies and he goes back and he like haunts the house that he lived in for a long time. It's kind of the briefest way to put it. Mm-hmm. The most simplest, I guess. Let's see. Casey Affleck is one of the main actors and Rooney Mara, as you said. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess <laughs> it's kind of weird because Casey Affleck has come under some some heat and this is one of those films he did before. Like right before. Yeah. Before. And... uh I think with this, I don't really want to talk about it too much, but I guess I just wanted to address it and say that I didn't necessarily want to talk about it. I think it's one of those things of, you know, separating the art from the artist because the art already exists. Mm -hmm. You know, might as well just look at it, try to look at it in a vacuum, I think. Yeah, if you can. Um, It does a disservice to everyone who worked hard on the movie. Uh, If there's a a bad apple who happened to also work on the movie, you know, I in in. Every aspect of art, I guess, every kind of art, I don't want to go through and start um, dismissing all this art because the artist is someone that I don't necessarily like, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And where do you draw the line of like, at, w- at what point, I don't know, at what point is art worthy of dismissing what people have done? And I, I think it just gets really weird and I think you just have to move on and you know, like Kevin Spacey, they're not going to work with him anymore in House of Cards, but I think you could still watch like those House of Cards seasons and right. and just enjoy them. Well, it's almost like um, after you find out about something, about someone like that, maybe watching things after that, that they're in, like new things that they're cast in, might have a bad taste in your mouth to it. But things that were already made and that you already liked or that were already considered good before that information broke out, I don't think it's fun to go back and and try to like pick apart um, yeah. things that you shouldn't like for various reasons. I think maybe it just, if, if a person rubs you the wrong way, maybe going forward, uh, ignore them. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So we'll, we'll move on to the movie now. And, and I guess the most obvious thing when you start watching this movie is the, uh, the framing, like the, the, the aspect ratio. Yeah. It's like some invented aspect ratio looks like. Yeah, I think so. And, and it, it might just be like regular, uh, like four by three with rounded edges <laughs> with rounded edges. Yeah, I think so. Um, but it kind of has this almost like home movie kind of look to it. It, but, lo- it looked like Instagram, the movie, right? Yeah. Like a lot of weird colored filters and, and squarish photography. <laughs> did, did you, did you like that? Did you have any feelings on that? Um, I was, I will say that the first five minutes of this movie I thought, oh no, what have I got? <laughs> what have I gotten into? You know, um, so did my girlfriend, but it wasn't long before you acclimate to the aspect ratio and, and you kind of start to say like, okay, this is, this is what he's doing. It's quiet. It's subdued. Um, yeah, I dig it. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a, a deliberate choice for, for doing it that way. Um, or at least I think there should be, I don't necessarily know what it is for this movie yet. I'm kind of actually hoping to get there as, as we talk about it. Cause yeah. I, I don't necessarily immediately see the reasoning behind that. Right. Like, mm-hmm. uh, I've seen other films where they do that. Um, uh, fish tank by Andrea Arnold, 
that's also shot uh, four by three. It doesn't have the rounded edges, but it's a right. straight up, straight up like square, mm-hmm. um, old school looking. And and uh, that whole movie is about a girl kind of trying to break out and feeling confined by like her situation, her like home life situation, and like where she lives, and she wants to break out and do something different, right? So like mm-hmm. this four by three kind of feels confining uh, for her, which it, you know makes sense. But I, I didn't quite get any of that with a ghost story, like nothing that obvious. Do you think maybe it has to do with um, trying to obscure the time in which everything is taking place? This movie kind of strikes me like there's multiple like vignettes, I guess, that he witnesses. Like it starts out with him and his girlfriend and they have flat screen TVs and modern-ish technology. But then it, it also goes for a few years, I assume, after they don't live in that house anymore and follow some other people. And then it also uh, jumps around in time earlier, way earlier chronologically than than any of the characters we've been yeah. following so far. So do you think maybe the aspect ratio has something to do with the fact that he wanted it to feel ambiguous as if to when you were? That makes sense. Like it, it kind of has a... A home like movie feel to it, but not like a from when kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's a, sort of a timeless feel to it i think right like it's like it's all new obviously but it's like the filters and like the coloring has made it to look old and faded like i said like instagram you know like it looks like there's a big instagram filter over every shot yeah uh, yeah absolutely to to kind of like obscure like that way it doesn't look new you know what i mean like even though they, they have a flat screen tv in their house you're not paying attention to it because it's barely in the this little bitty frame it's just all about the characters and the emotions so i if I had to guess, I would imagine it's probably just to to give it a uniform look throughout every um, generation. Yeah, every, yeah, every time period. Yeah, time that period. makes sense. And I think it's even regardless of like diving in and finding like a deeper meaning like that behind it. Like it seems to fit with like the vibe of the story. Like it's so it's really simple and like character based and like mm-hmm. and I just thought it. I never really questioned it. Like, why is this like this? This is like weirding me out. Right. Yeah. No, I don't think it ever bothered me other than like the initial, like, oh no, this movie. Yeah. I had watched the trailer too. So I think I I knew what was coming. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't, uh, did you watch the trailer before? If I did, it doesn't stand out. I tend to try and not pay attention to trailers as often as I can. Yeah, fair enough. That makes sense. I think the only reason I watched it is because we went to a film festival with my film, and he was one of like the guest speakers there. And uh, so, like the writer of my film, like met him or something, was talking about him, and he like he sent it to me and was like, "You have to check out this this trailer by that guy we met." Because at the time, I hadn't seen any of his other films, so I didn't really talk to him. I was kind of like, I don't want to talk to him and have to pretend that I've seen some of his films or right. <laughs> have like any sort of awkward conversation. Right. Um, so that's one of the reasons I watched the trailer. But I think you and I have talked before in the past, and we're both kind of anti-trailer a lot of the times. Yeah. If it's a movie that I'm at all interested in, I would prefer to not know anything about it going into it. Yeah. If I, if I need the trailer to sell me on something I'm not sold on, and that's it. Yeah, exactly. So like, like, if I've never heard of it, I'll I'll watch a trailer. So, I mean, I could have watched the Ghost Story trailer, but... Usually if I hear that something's getting like good word of mouth reviews and I know it might be like a big deal later on in the year, I'll uh I'll just remember the title or the director or the actor and uh not focus on the marketing so much. So in the story starts out where with uh Casey Affleck and Rooney Mara and they're uh, they're getting ready to move out, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they're getting ready to move out and then He doesn't want to. Yeah, he doesn't see why they should. Um, so I, I guess their relationship's not like in the best place. It, I just really don't necessarily get that vibe. Maybe not in the best place, but I also don't think I never got the vibe that it was in a troubled place because they do have that really long shot where, um, you know, they just cuddle in bed and they love on yeah. each other and stuff like that. It was really sweet. I enjoyed it. Yeah. I don't necessarily feel it's like they were in a doomed relationship, but we're just at a, maybe like an unsettled place sure. where, and they didn't resolve it at the point where Casey Affleck dies. Right. Yeah. Life was starting to uh, take its toll on their relationship, possibly like the, this everyday stresses of 
like moving situations and things like that. Yeah. And, and I guess you brought up the long shots. There are a lot of like long shots in this movie where we hold for a really long time on like just one shot or like one character doing something. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't know. Sometimes that can be kind of boring and you would think, but uh, how did you feel about those? Like I'm thinking specifically like the shot where Casey Affleck is, is dead and he's in the, um, under the sheet at the table. Like we hold on that a long time before he stands up. Oh, the, like, before he sits up. Yeah. The first scene where he quote unquote comes back. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, th- like I said, that's what I was talking about at the beginning when I said like, Oh no, what am I in for? Um, it seemed like at the beginning I was like, all of these shots are so long and they're so wide and the, the color, like the sound is so muted and the color is so kind of muted that I wasn't sure I was going to dig it, but I ended up digging it a lot, uh, just about five to 10 minutes into the movie. You know, once, once things started actually happening, I really liked it, but I think if it had just been any more wide shots of, of Casey Affleck and Rooney Mara hanging out in that house before before the ghost stuff started happening. It might have been <laughs> it might have been uh, bad news for me. Yeah, I think you have to get used to the pacing a little bit and once you're on board with it, um you kind of if you're on board with it, I guess I guess you could easily uh not get in line with the pacing and not be into it and then in which case you should probably turn it off, like if you <laughs> if you haven't seen it yet and you're watching it and you're 10 minutes in yeah uh, if you're not digging like if you're just like this is way too long and, and boring uh you should probably turn it off because i don't ne- necessarily think it deviates from that pace no. <laughs> at all ever uh I, I would say the one part where i did like i was like okay let's let's move on is when rudy mar is eating that pie man she eats like that whole pie too yeah and i suppose it's impressive <laughs> like thinking about it in terms of performance that they obviously, I hope they did that in one take and didn't make make her eat that much pie twice. Oh man. I, yeah, I don't, yeah, I was thinking that same thing. I was just kind of like, is this, why are we watching her eat this whole pie? Like, I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a big moment for her. So, but I think that's probably the most acting she gets to do was, uh, in that whole movie is, uh, eating that pie. Yeah, I guess it's her biggest scene, and maybe maybe as a director, he thought like I put her through that, yeah. and we filmed it, and so yeah, that's I better. She really threw up in that toilet, so I'm gonna keep it in. Yeah, <laughs> somebody told me that they they'd read that that was her first time to ever have pie. What in real life, like Rooney Mara's? What? Is... <laughs> I know it's totally irrelevant to the to the movie, but I think that's where does Rooney Mara live? Funny. The moon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, how do you not have pie at this yeah. point? Like, I don't know where she's from. But the moon, I, I guess. mean, maybe the moon, maybe yeah. the moon, you you might be right. Um, <laughs> but uh, to have that be your first experience with pie, I don't know if that's totally fair. I hope she doesn't just yeah. hate pie. Yeah. And plus it looked like a pumpkin pie. Uh, I would have given her like an apple or a key lime myself. Yeah. A better pie, <laughs> a, b- sure. a better pie for her first and terrible pie experience. <laughs> yeah. At this point we have, um, Casey Affleck's like he's walking around in a sheet and I actually was looking into it and, and I, I believe it actually is Casey Affleck under the sheet the whole time. That's some really cool looking sheet special effects too. I, w- I wanted to add like the way it looks. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was mostly practical. I'm sure it uh, was, I'm, but it had to have been touched up here and there because it just, I don't know. It looked good for some reason. It always looked like yeah. it popped on screen. Yeah. I think I, they went out of their way to make sure that you couldn't see ever see the actor's eyes under the, uh, under the sheet or like through the eye holes. Um, but yeah, just it's an interest, interesting choice to me to cast Casey Affleck and then put him in a sheet the whole time. Yeah. I, and <laughs> I assumed one of the reasons for that was that you could shoot with Casey Affleck for like two to three days and knock out the rest of his stuff. Yeah. And, and give him then top you have just an, yeah. <laughs> then you have an extra in a sheet the whole time. Like, or just, you know, some yeah. other guy that's like roughly Casey Affleck's height. But uh, I don't know, it's interesting to me that they they went all out and were like, yeah, Casey, you're you're gonna do this and be under under the sheet. Yeah, especially since he didn't make any noises or he didn't even make any like uh, distinct movements that that you were like, ah, that's Casey Affleck under there. 
Oh, there's one <laughs> shot actually that happens uh, pretty quickly after he becomes a ghost, and he's actually like looking in on her, and uh, it's like it's, it takes place all in one shot, kind of. But she leaves the the house like four times. Oh yeah, yeah. I really like. Yeah, that. like she she comes out of the hallway, goes out of the door, mm-hmm. and it, like almost as soon as the door closes, she comes out of the hallway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really again, yeah, like, wearing a different outfit. Exactly. I really liked how uh, the director just played with time, and like it just kind of like through the eyes of this ghost, you basically never know when you are, where you are, how much time is passing. It all just seems so vague and 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 fluid. It's neat. Yeah, but. She, I guess it's a really good because the story once once Casey Affleck becomes a ghost, I, I would say it's from like his point of view, right? Like mm-hmm. the, the Casey Affleck ghost, right? Uh, so he does a lot of these things that's like really cool tricks that, like, like you said, they make you unsure of how much time has actually passed, right? Which is kind of a big thing in this movie. He he's there for a long, long time. He goes on through like other people move in and out of the house. Mm-hmm. Uh, he even goes back in time a little bit yeah. later. Before that, he uh, he starts like living with a Mexican family mm-hmm. for or haunting for Mexican a few months family. at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, we're not not sure of how long they're there, but you at least get through like Christmas. And I, I mean, the whole movie is like really really pretty, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Like it's just like a I don't know, sort of like Terrence Malick. Esque. Oh, I know the yeah. uh, the living room felt like a totally different house whenever they had the Christmas tree was all lit up and like the family was all celebrating Christmas. It felt like yeah. it had been years later and another family had come in and completely taken over the house and envisioned it in a different way. You know, like have you ever been yeah. to like a house that you used to live in or you've been in before, but someone else lives there now and like it's the same house, the layout's the same, but the furniture's totally different and it feels like a completely new place. And I don't know. I think they did a good job of capturing that every time there was like a new group of people coming into this house, it felt like a dynamic shift in like, yeah, like pretty unrecognizable. Yeah. yeah. Except for like, there's like a few, I think major things that they keep the same, and you know, like the things that are rec- recognizable, but for the most part, yeah, it, it does feel like totally different. And I just wanted like the, when they're, the kids are there, it's like the Christmas time. Like, it's just like beautiful. Like that's kind of the image. Mm-hmm. One of the images that really sticks with me from the movie. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's so warm, but like, it seems like it's all like all the light seems like it's coming from like the Christmas tree kind of. Yeah. And maybe that's it is that a lot of the movies pretty cool, like tones, like it's very blue. Mm-hmm. Right. And you know, except for, I, I think once, once he's a ghost anyways, like it's all very blue mm-hmm. and like daylight ish. And, and that stuff sticks out to me so much because it, Maybe it's just like the kids in Christmas time, but like it just seemed like a very beautiful scene to me. And that was like the maybe the one time where the house was at its like most beautiful because after that, like there's the I guess like college age people uh-huh. live in the house. Oh, yeah. And then it just seems like a college house, right? Like it's mm-hmm. not really particularly good looking at all. It's just kind of drab. Yeah, it's just a bunch of people hanging out, partying, and getting wasted in it. Yeah. And, I feel like there we get one of like the longest like actual scenes, like t- typical movie scenes. Yeah, in the movie. yeah. Who invited the philosophical redneck to like this college party? Yeah, and he talks for a long time, and that's like there's just this long scene of him going off on. Yeah, this like sweaty guy. It almost guy feels like overalls. a different movie for a while. Yeah, but like I want to know, like this guy clearly is not from the same group as all these college kids that he's hanging out with at this party. Not that that matters, but anyway, I thought it was strange. <laughs> Yeah, it, it felt just kind of out of place to me. I, and I guess like them, thematically, the stuff that he's talking about, I don't remember it specifically. It's actually been like eh, maybe like two weeks since I've seen the movie. I know you've seen it a little bit more recent than I have. But do you remember like, Last the night. stuff that he's talking about? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Last night, yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, a lot of it is talking about um, like on a long enough timeline, nothing means anything uh, because – Everything you do or say or whatever, it doesn't matter once humanity is gone anyway, so you might as well just chill. Uh, I, there's a lot more to it than that, basically. It's not, that's a very, yeah. it, very ineloquent way of putting it, but um, he, sure. he goes on for a long time, and it's kind of just philosophical conversation. Did you like it? Did you like the conversation? Were yeah. Were you interested in it? Actually, yeah, that was probably one of my favorite scenes of the movie. 
um, I actually was wondering, I don't know, I was wondering, because Casey Affleck is sitting here listening to this guy talk as a ghost, and I was wondering if any of that was going to sink in with his arc, and maybe I'd need to see it again, because like I said, I don't remember exactly everything that was said, I just remember it kind of went all over the place. Yeah, uh, if I remember correctly, I think you, you've kind of summed it up as far as like its big themes. Yeah. Of of everything he's saying, he does go on a long time about it. But, and I think it's interesting. You have that conversation coming at you, and, and you're not necessarily thinking of it like the way that you and I would think about that conversation if we were actually sitting there having that, you know, listening to somebody talk about that. Right. Uh, we're hearing it through like the filter of like ghost Casey Affleck, right? That's true. Like, and I think that makes it really interesting. That's what like made that scene for me, I think like rather than it feel like some guy just going on and on, it's like thinking about it. And like, I guess, uh, you know, having the empathy of like being in, in the ghost mind, like hearing all of that stuff, it, it was really sad. Right. Cause basically, basically he's hearing that, uh, everything that maybe you're holding on to, uh, it's all for nothing basically. A lot of it, yeah. A lot of it seems because every time Casey Affleck looks across the house at the other ghost, I assume the lady ghost because she has flowers on her sheet. Um, she doesn't even remember why she's there anymore. And as soon as she's like, "I don't think they're coming back," you know, she just disappears. So, and she asks Casey Affleck, "Who are you waiting for?" So yeah. So maybe that scene has something to do with. Casey Affleck overhearing it so that he can realize that these human things that he's holding on to just don't matter. Yeah. And, and I guess there's a little bit of suspense to that scene. Doesn't that, that, uh, the girl ghost that's in the house next door, doesn't she disappear before that college scene? No. Uh, because after it's after, because it's when the houses are tore down. It's after, it's after the college kids, Oh, that's right. But before he goes back to see the settlers building the house, I believe. Yeah, so well, I guess that, that scene has a lot of weight because what that scene is doing is planting that seed of doubt in his mind of, or in, in your mind, I guess, as an audience and possibly his mind of, like, is this all pointless? Like, mm-hmm. you know, because the whole thing that he's waiting around for, or what he does, like, every time he gets a, a minute is he goes to the, the wall where Rooney Mara's character had written down a note and she had slid it into like a crevice in the wall and he's trying to like pick it out. Right. Like that's mm-hmm. his, that's kind of his goal. The whole movie is like, I need to get this piece of paper, but right. You know, stuff happens and he doesn't get it immediately. But I guess in the rules of this universe, in this story, the, what keeps them there is like the hope and belief. Mm-hmm. And as soon as that's gone, I get this other ghost disappears. So like, Casey Affleck having heard that big, uh, you know, spiel by that guy was like, I don't know. It has a lot of weight to it. I think once you get to like, Oh, is he doubting? Should he doubt what happens if he doubts too much? Does he have to actually like communicate it to somebody else? Right. Or at what point is him doubting going to end up with him just disappearing like this other ghost? Right. Exactly. And, and how long is he planning on waiting before something happens? You know? How many generations of people is he going to see in this house? And uh, and right after that is basically when the house gets demolished, if I'm not mistaken, right? And then he goes back to uh, yeah. people settling. He gets demolished. Oh, actually, yeah, and then they, they, they settle some new... And then they build a new... building. They build like an office building. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It comes like a commercial property. and That's right. Um, and he's able to go up in floors, just not off the property, I guess. Yeah, and yeah, and he climbs to the top, and this, he jumps off, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's like he's going to commit ghost suicide. Yeah. And uh, however that works, which I guess we see how that works yeah. in the world of this movie. Yeah. It doesn't. No, it doesn't. He, he ends up back <laughs> in the same spot, but like, which I, I guess like in the times when like the land is being settled. Yeah, by, that's it. By white people. Yeah, who are then killed by not white people. Yep. So... Which is kind of an, an interesting scene. I think we move on pretty Well, he watches that, like, little girl d- body, and then, like, it goes through, like, the various forms of decay, but all within, like, a minute. I really liked that, too. 
Yeah, that was, it was very interesting and, and like a striking image, like one that really kind of, you know, metaphorically punches you in the face. You're like, whoa. Yeah, it wow. was it was just like, yeesh, goodness. <laughs> so eventually they build a house back, right? And we get to, eventually we get to a point where uh, Rui Mar and Casey Affleck move in. So now he's, I know this is where it gets like really weird, like, um, like interstellar-ish was kind of what I thought of. Mm-hmm. Um, they've moved into the house and Casey Affleck is still there as a ghost haunting it. And we see that like certain things that happened at the beginning of the film were just the, the ghost version of Casey Affleck doing these things, yeah. which wasn't a surprise to me. Yeah. I was about to say, did that really, uh, did that not dawn on you until it happened? <laughs> <laughs> no. And I guess that's something I'd, I want to talk about, I guess is like, you know, this happened with the interstellar too. Um, you know, interstellar starts and the, the, the daughter's like, there's a ghost behind my bookshelf and yeah. that talks to me. And like, I think it just from the get go, you're like, okay, it's, it's Matthew McConaughey. Right. Right. Yeah. Spoilers <laughs> for interstellar. Sure. <laughs> um, that being said, I think it works better in this movie because it doesn't seem like a twist that is supposed to be ahead of you. Uh, in, yeah. the, in this one, I don't get the sense that he was real. The director was really, trying to reveal anything to you there. You know, I think as soon as you know the premise of the movie and you hear that noise, you're going to be like, oh, okay, that's either a ghost or it's him as a ghost later. Yeah, it doesn't feel like a, a revelation at all. It just feels right. like Duh. feels like something that you're like, okay, yeah, now we're back here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like now we can end this movie because we've gone in a circle. Is kind of what it felt like to me. Because yeah. um, this isn't really a movie with like a uh, a normal structure, right? So I think circling it back around like that and bringing us back to a scene at the beginning, it gives it like a nice point to where like the audience can feel closure, I guess, if he starts to try to wrap up this idea. Yeah, I think it has some structure in a sense of like it's a person with a problem. Yeah, yeah, that's true. In a sense, uh, like, you know, it's a ghost with he's got to get this uh, slip out of the wall mm-hmm. and he's waiting for that and waiting for potentially – uh, Rooney Mara to come back. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, but like I, the ways that he can solve that problem are very limited <laughs> and a lot of other stuff happens. That's kind of, you know, not so like straightforward plot wise. In the end, uh, he finally is able to dig the paper out mm-hmm. and he reads it. And then as soon as he reads it, he disappears and the sheet falls. Yeah, promptly right. disappears, just like that other yeah. lady ghost. And so I guess, you know, he's done with whatever it is that he's waiting around for. I guess just like the other ghost was, they weren't done, but they had given up, so they're no longer waiting for anything. Right. I think once you've either lost the plot and you don't know your mission, or once, I guess, you've completed it, you just disappear. Let me ask you this. At the beginning of the movie, when he's in the hospital and he's actually leaving, and that that like light opens up on the wall. Was that him consciously ignoring the afterlife and being like, I'm staying. Yeah, I think so. I think like, that's what it was, it was too. Kind of a, yeah. a representation of, I, uh, you know, I've got, I'm not interested in going down that way yet because I've got this other thing to do. Right. So, yeah. So that kind of explains why not everyone becomes a ghost. So not every house has ghosts walking around that you can't see, but, um, more of just every now and then, someone just doesn't go where they're supposed to go and stays too long and gets lost in time. Uh, doesn't he go back to the house like before she actually puts the slip into the wall? Uh, maybe that sounds right. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's yeah. the way it works. So it's like, I guess his, at some point, like his mission changes. Cause it seems like the reason that he would stay is I guess because he doesn't want to leave with Rooney Mara. And like I said, we said earlier, like their relationship seems to be in like a, place where it's being tested Mm -hmm. and they're not necessarily sturdy and they haven't like resolved those issues of moving out or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So it feels like maybe that's like his reason to stay at first, but over time it becomes about this slip of paper, which I think is interesting. I don't necessarily know what to make of that. I don't know. I don't know if it necessarily means anything or if it's just kind of showing that this is what he is choosing to stay for, even though ultimately it doesn't matter. 
but he's not in a good place. He's using this as his excuse to change, like to stay basically and not do what he's supposed to do, which is move on. I think he's basically like once he sees that, that kind of becomes his excuse, but I, I wouldn't even know if he knows why. Cause remember when he talks to the other ghost, that ghost is confused. That ghost doesn't remember who they're waiting for. It doesn't remember what's going on. And then as soon as the house is demolished, it disappears because it, it's like, I don't think whoever I'm waiting for is even coming back. And then they just disappear. So maybe it doesn't really matter what he's waiting for. It's just like once he has it on his mind, like I'm going to do something, I'm going to stay for this reason. It probably becomes less and less clear as time goes on. And it's just more yeah. of like, I remember I have a mission I'm doing, but I don't remember why I started it. Yeah. Maybe that paper becomes the more concrete thing because it, it, it is always there for him to pull out. Right, so like that's, and that's, he, he can remember that. that. Yeah, even if he doesn't remember Rooney Mara anymore, he remembers, I'm trying to get this paper out of this like crevice in this wall, you know? But it's, an, it's an interesting interesting movie. It's very very emotional, I think. Like, uh, it just, There's no, like, uh, you know, much anticipation of, like, is he going to get this thing out of the wall? What's going to happen? Like, there's, It's not like that at all. It's just kind of one, like, big sort of, like, emotional ride. I think. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I uh, I got emotional in a couple parts, um, and I didn't think I would, especially since there's no dialogue. But the combination of, like, the editing and the music he chose in certain scenes just made, like, the emotion just build and build. Um, I thinking specifically of the scene where Rooney Mara actually leaves the house and drives away, and there's music playing, and it just, like, stays on her face for a while. Yeah, yeah. This is a lot of that is, like, really get you moving um casey affleck's song like when he plays the song for her oh yeah, yeah. and like watching her listen to the song I mean, it's cutting with the headphones yeah. on like it's cutting between the two yeah that just oh like I, that one just like there was no they weren't talking it's just like the the combination of like the song and their, their performances and shot i was just like it, it that's probably like the most i was i was moved during the movie definitely yeah that's a good one too i don't know do you like the movie do we want to give it a rating we have never done that before. I don't think Ooh. we should. Well, I'd, I'm on Letterboxd, and I rate movies that I see anyway, even though sure. uh, I change the ratings usually within like three or four days after having seen them and sitting on the movie a while. But uh, I gave this movie a solid four out of five stars. Yeah, I think that's that's about where I'd give it. it it's I think it's one that I'm not going to want to rewatch a lot, but it feels like one that like, I, it would just hit me, like, you know, like every now and then I'm just like, man, I really want to watch Tree of Life, right? Right. And or you know, just one of those movies where I'm like, there's no story per se, like there's not like a really defined story. Like, I just want to watch something that's just gonna like move me on like a, a deeper level and not like distract me with like, you know, person with a problem trying to solve it, sort of stuff. Yeah, I get that. There are very few movies that have that feeling to them where you can just sit and just kind of enjoy and don't have to worry about the plot trying to be. And, oh, I remember what I was going to say, actually, really quick. The, uh, there's a lot of, um, like, Kuleshov effect going on with the ghosts, like, in terms of the uh, emotion, um, which I think is something that's working really well for the movie, is that you can kind of feel fill in a lot of the emotions yourself. Um, the, the best example, or maybe, like, the most modern example other than, like, I guess like the textbook Kuleshov one is like Woody from Toy Story Mm -hmm. just has this like blank expression all the time. Yeah. But depending on what's going on, like you kind of fill in his emotions. Right. Um, Like it's Woody, but like his expression seems just so sad. And we get that with the ghost, right? Like at least I did. Like, like I found myself filling in his emotions a lot. Oh, definitely. Seeing emotion in what is essentially just a sheet with eyes. Yeah, definitely. Especially with the score, like the scene where he was walking around the newly constructed office building and he was like looking out windows and looking at everything that was going on. And the score was just really good. I, uh, I definitely got the feeling that he was not in a good place. And I, I really like the movie. So that, that's it. I don't think I'm going to give it a rating, but yeah, yeah. It's I, I recommend it watching matter. it. If, if you haven't seen it and you've listened to this whole thing, there's, you know, you've <laughs> maybe ruined the movie a little bit for yourself in some ways, but uh, but I maybe watching you'll it. appreciate it more. All right. Well, you want to talk about three billboards now? Uh, let's do it. What's along what you can and cannot say on a billboard? 
I assume you can't say nothing defamatory and you can't say fuck, piss, or cunt. That right? Or anus? I think I'll be all right then. So the next movie we're talking about today is Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri, uh, starring Frances McDormand and Sam Rockwell. I've actually just watched this movie for a second time in preparation to talk about it. What are your thoughts on Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri? Um, I watched it a, a while ago. I watched most of it again for a second time to, to get ready for this episode. I didn't quite make it all the way through, and it's probably a little bit telling on how I feel about it. Um, well, I actually liked it, and I found the second time a lot more trying to get through than the first time. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I, just, I knew it was it was feeling a little excruciating. I made it I made it probably about 30 minutes through <laughs> again. Yeah. Um, and and that's not most that's no it's not most right. <laughs> I, I probably misspoke and or lied um but so i liked it when i saw it in theaters right i I walked out and i was like you know that was that was pretty good i i enjoyed it there's some things i didn't like yeah uh but, you know but but i enjoyed it and then as time went on and i started thinking about the movie more and more like it it kind of you know soured over time with me really like i started to think about it like, and it just, certain things started to bother me more. You know, that's and... not an uncommon sentiment though. Uh, I've listened to some other podcasts and, um, some of the hosts have a similar viewpoint, which is that they loved it when they first saw it, but then it soured over time. I'm anxious to hear what soured for you. I think the big thing that kind of, one of the big things that bothered me was, uh, Sam Rockwell's character, I thought he, there was, I think he was good. Like I thought his performance uh, was good. I, I always sure he, have liked Sam Rockwell. He plays the um, a deputy, I guess a sheriff's deputy that uh, has a history of violence on the job and racist behavior against African Americans in a small Missouri town. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I think the more I thought about, the more I was like, what was that about? It's like his whole racist background, and there's several people that make comments to him throughout the movie of like, oh, I thought you beat, you know, up, black you beat up black people. Yeah. Isn't that what you do? Yeah. And early on when he's when he first goes and sees the billboards, mm-hmm. there's like a black guy uh, painting it, and the black guy like recognizes him. He's like, oh, I know who you are, and like you kind of get this vibe. That yeah. that is about is about his. It was a big story when it happened. Thing. Yeah, yeah, and I just I feel like they make such a big deal out of it. And and correct me if I'm wrong, having having seen the movie more recently, like that doesn't really pay off or come back in any sort of way. It seems kind of like it seems kind of like oh this guy is a cop and he's racist and unlikable, <laughs> and it almost seemed like a, a tool to make him unlikable rather than part of like the plot it seemed kind of irrelevant sure now that's the way this movie i guess for lack of a better word treats its minority characters is what i find to be one of the most problematic parts of the movie Mm -hmm. i feel like that character you're talking about the beginning um the 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 young black man who's painting the sign and then also Francis McDormand's co-worker, I feel both of those characters are given short shrift in the movie, kind of. They are, they're there to show up conveniently and say a couple, like, witty things, but they don't get thoughts and motivations of their own. They're just there to help out Francis McDormand's character or antagonize Sam Rockwell's character. Yeah, they're certainly not um, fully fleshed out. And in some ways they're sort of reduced to stereotypes in a sense, I feel like. Maybe not stereotypes. I wouldn't say that. But I would say that they are not. Yeah, one note. And they're there. Like they show up and like conveniently the the two black people that are in the movie. Well, I guess besides the the chief that comes in later, the new sheriff. um, And they, they end up together. But it seems like it seemed weird and inconvenient and, yeah. and maybe like, um, 
it didn't quite fit the way, and it kind of fell flat for me. But then again, I'm also a white man, so I would be <laughs> interested to hear uh, someone else's opinion. Right, and and I guess I, what felt flat for me was is like the Sam Rockwell racist stuff. Like it didn't, like it just didn't like pay off in any way for me, and like it left me feeling like it left me feeling like there was a part of the movie that just didn't like go anywhere. Like there was just this right. loose thread. Like maybe if he had to come to terms with a black man and have a black man forgive him instead of Francis McDormand, it, it could have made for a, a more satisfying arc or maybe just drop the racist angle from the beginning and just maybe make him a, a violent cop who beats people, but maybe not necessarily minority people if you're not going to pay that particular thread off in any kind of redemption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I think dropping it all together, because like, he's already pretty unlikable. It's true. Like, and he's a terrible cop. Um, yeah, he's pretty unlikable, but but I, I do find it interesting because like Sam Rockwell is so good at being like that unlikable mm-hmm. person that like I just really like watching him be unlikable. Absolutely, so, and it's a it's a bit weird. Yeah, and and we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves on the Sam Rockwell thing. Let's go ahead and back up to um, Woody Harrelson's character. So the movie starts off, and Francis McDormand puts up the three billboards calling out Woody Harrelson's character uh, for not having made any arrests while her daughter was being raped and killed or for her daughter having been raped and killed. And she puts up these billboards. So let me ask you this. If Woody Harrelson had not been considered an honorable man, do you think anyone would have had problem in the town with those billboards? You know what I mean? If it had been just a whole station full of Sam Rockwell type characters which it seems like it mostly was because most of the deputies who aren't Woody Harrelson are pretty stupid in this movie. Yeah, so like if the if the billboard had been about Sam Rockwell. Yeah, if it had been about Sam Rockwell or if, if Woody Harrelson just hadn't been so beloved in that town, do you think that uh, the same th- the same events could have happened the same way? No, and I, and I think that that is uh, intentional from Francis McDormand's character is to pick – you know, pick the head person out, the one that people like Mm -hmm. and call him out because that's going to get attention. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true, I think. So in this movie, when Woody Harrelson's character writes those letters to all the characters, like he has cancer and he wants to go ahead and end it quickly, so he shoots himself early in the movie, but he writes a letter to the wife, to Frances McDormand, and to Sam Rockwell. Now, in those letters... He talks about how he believes that Sam Rockwell's character is actually a good man deep down, if he could let go of this anger. But let me ask you this. Sam Rockwell's character is clearly not a good guy and clearly deserves no more second chances or third chances or whatever in this movie. (laughs) So is Woody Harrelson's character actually a bad guy by allowing an officer like Sam Rockwell's character to even remain on the force. Like this guy gives us nothing to believe that he has any redeeming qualities, but Woody Harrelson keeps telling us he does. I don't know. That's a, that's an interesting way to, to think about it. I guess like, is he not quite guilty by association, but like letting it, he's sitting there while it's happening and he's not. Yeah. He, he knows Woody Harrelson's him. or not, excuse me. Woody Harrelson knows that Sam Rockwell's character is a racist, violent, moron and well, did, did, it even has what, to restrain him at some point in the movie from like beating up somebody so what strikes me is this the fact that maybe Woody Harrelson's character is not as honorable just because it's a small town in Missouri you know just like any small town in any state uh, it's going to be less formal right like the the locals are going to know all the officers by their first name and they're going to go to church together and they're going to their kids are going to go to school together and everything like that so yeah. I can see how this police station can be so terrible with such terrible employees and still be functioning in a small Southern America town. Maybe that's what Martin McDonough is trying to say, right? Which is just that maybe not so much that racism is something that needs to be redeemed later, but this is his view of what a small American town is. And it would seem dishonest to make a movie about a small 
Southern American police force and not have the racism element, which is what he, as an outsider uh, of America, you know, not American, would would view it as. Yeah. So Martin McDonough is English? I thought he was right? Irish. but he, Irish? He might. I think that's right. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. So he's he's Irish. And I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's both an interesting thing and maybe has something to do with some of the faults of the movie is, is him being an outsider because some of the movie does feel like this is, you know, an outsider's view of like, this is what I think a small town, like a small Midwest town is like. Right. Right. And I think that would explain the, you know, some of the, the racism without like, feeling like that's an important plot element. Right. Like, maybe he just like thinks people that, are just racist, right? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he just thinks that Americans, especially cops in the South, uh, from a stereotypical standpoint, I'm not saying this is true, but maybe he views them as just American stereotypes, right? This is what he views us as. Yeah. And, and I guess it's sort of a, systemic or not noticed because it's what they've grown up around and, and going to like Woody Harrelson and his views on Sam Rockwell. Like I'm two, two thoughts I have on that is like why he would like let him around one. Like you said, small town, everybody knows everybody. I think Sam Rockwell grew up there. Yeah. They probably known each other and, since kindergarten or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Like Woody, Woody Harrelson probably saw him as like a toddler or right. You know, a baby at some point. Right. Um, and, Two, and then Woody Harrelson doesn't. I don't think he has any sons, right? Like he just has two daughters, right? Yeah, me, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think that that definitely plays into it. That that's probably it feels like a deliberate thought to me, um, as far as like a you know writing a story goes. Um, so I think there maybe there is this bit of like father sonness to him of like you don't want to kick him off the force because you've, you've a known him for so long and B it's like kind of like a son to you. Sure. And I guess in a small town like that, when you don't answer to anyone higher up and there's not a social justice warrior presence in the town to put pressure on you to fire somebody, uh, what's the point of firing somebody, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and I guess, just to the billboards like at least early in the movie the movie kind of moves on beyond it but at first like the whole town is like super against these billboards Mm -hmm. right and not that the town ever changes it's just that the movie kind of lets that aspect go yeah yeah i think maybe what was most interesting to me when i saw it in theaters and one of the things that made me like it uh is the you know the parallels with what's what was going on at least like it was being discussed a lot like in the news and media uh at the time when i saw it was the the whole like kneeling during the national anthem oh thing. right and and that kind of goes along with other stuff that's been like questioning of police and um you know like riots in like ferguson missouri mm-hmm. and and all of that stuff like it felt uh really important i guess like a, a, as like a commentary on that sort of stuff and and i think that is like really the most interesting thing for me about the movie is, is viewing it as like a commentary. Um, I, I think it gets a little weird cause like it's a white woman, Francis McDormand calling out the cops. Right. But you know, it's just kind of what, what she's asking for isn't unreasonable, right? Like she's wanting better investigation arrests, uh, for like the rape and murder of her daughter. And, still people are like, Hey, you're, you know, those billboards are, are, aren't in good taste as if like they're being offended somehow measures up to like, you know, her being upset about her daughter. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And, and to top it off, these billboards are on a road that they, they mentioned this a couple of times on a road that no one goes down. Like, and you can see them from her front door. So the only people that actually see these billboards are her, her family, and people going to her house. And I guess maybe anyone who happens to be on that backcountry road, but based on the language of the movie used, not many people even know about that road or go down it. 
So these people, like the fat dentists or whatever, are all getting worked up over something that they haven't even probably seen in person, right? And they don't yeah. they don't have to look at it every day. They just know it exists and they've got an opinion. Cuz it's, you know, it's a small town and everyone's got an opinion. Yeah, and and, and, and there's just the opinion of like whether whether what you're saying is right or wrong, like you shouldn't question the cops. Like you shouldn't right. do anything defaming don't rock the, cops. the boat. Like that's yeah. And and I just think that's like a really important uh <laughs> theme and and I think might be like like I said the best thing about this movie for me is like touching on that theme because that's you know that's that's something that I find interesting is that you know some people don't want to think that like you can't um you can't question something that you love like you have to either love something or hate it. Like there's no in between. You can't call out something mm-hmm. and still respect it. I always use like in, in these conversations, I always use the, the metaphor of like a, being a fan of a sports team. Right. You know, uh, we'll just, I will go NFL, even though I personally hate NFL <laughs> and football. Um, we'll just say, so like if you're a fan of like the Dallas Cowboys, but their quarterback sucks, like you can still be a fan of the Dallas Cowboys and call like for them to get a new quarterback. Right. You can be like, man, our quarterback's no good. We need to get better. But like the rest of our team's good. Right. And I'm still a fan. Like you can do that. But when it comes to like police and like the people in this movie in the town, like they don't have that. It's like if you're questioning them at all, that's inappropriate and you shouldn't do that. And the most frustrating part about it is, is because it seems like every cop in this movie is completely incompetent. Uh, (laughs) That they're definitely in need of second guessing. Yeah. And let change the subject a little bit. Like wh- what did you think about Woody Harrelson in this movie? Like, uh, as, a, for, as like an actor, like in his performance and, or his, you know, even his character. I feel like he says goddamn too much. Like, uh, it annoyed me. I don't, there's like, the, I think the very first scene you see at him at the dinner table, uh, like he answers the phone and he's like, God damn it. I'm having my goddamn dinner. Or something like yeah. that. And then, yeah, yeah, and then like later there's like a scene where like the little girls are on the blanket and he's like, no one gets off this fucking blanket, god damn it. Or, you know, or it was just like, it just seemed too much. It just seemed like maybe Woody Harrelson doesn't do the swearing stuff that like Martin McDonough's dialogue uh, requires. I feel like his dialogue is a lot like Quentin Tarantino's dialogue, which is... In the hands of the right actor, like Francis McDormand, it's a, it's wonderful. It works. Yeah. In the hands of someone who doesn't get it or doesn't come from that background or doesn't have the comedic timing, it feels weird and flat. And I feel like Woody Harrelson falls into the latter category. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. And that was one of the things I walked away not liking the first time I saw it was Woody Harrelson. I thought, yeah. like, I don't know if his, it was just like his performance felt like flat to me and uninteresting and like it almost felt like he was phoning the performance in like it seemed like really half-hearted to me and maybe it, maybe you're right that it, it he just wasn't maybe the right person uh to sync up with like the dialogue that uh was written I, for him. yeah i think there's a quirkiness and a humor that some actors can really jive with in this movie and some do not and uh francis mcdormand works sam rockwell works uh woody harrelson did not and I'll tell you another character that everything they said fell flat for me, which was um, the young girlfriend of the John Hawks ex-husband yes. character. I do not like that actor. Or I don't know <laughs> if that actress, uh, that, that might be mean to her, but I don't like that part. Yeah. Yeah. I think everything she said, I think she did okay with what she had, but it felt like, uh, I don't know, the, the humor just felt like off. Like it didn't quite yeah. mesh seamlessly with the movie it felt like okay let's take let's take a break from the movie Mm -hmm. and have this little humorous scene with with her right like almost every time that she was right like she did something when she used the bathroom in in francis mcdormand's house and she's like is this a bad time this is a bad time i'll just come back later uh yeah it felt out of place yeah and i think that's that's some of the issue with the movie i think is like uh, it's kind of a little back and forth on its tone yes Yes, I think that's the biggest problem with the movie, in my opinion. Um, if they could just cut out some of the 
the humor that fell flat and make it maybe more of a serious tone, I think it would benefit the overall movie, right? It seemed like uh, he couldn't decide if he wanted to be... Like, it seemed like he was inspired by the Coen brothers, but he couldn't tell if he wanted to be No Country for Old Men or Intolerable Cruelty. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, it's just... It's like high comedy, like really high comedy, and then really serious dark stuff. Um, yeah, and but, so it just feels like two different two different ideas at the time that, that that don't like mesh well together. And I think they can. Like, No Country for Old Men has some like really funny stuff in it. Sure, right? Sure. And like, but you know, it's it's just wasn't working. And Woody Harrelson was even like when Woody Harrelson killed himself. Like to, to go back to him briefly, like. It, I just didn't feel anything. I I liked it whenever I know this is like a cheesy thing in movies and we don't like voiceover normally, but I'm not gonna lie, whenever the wife was reading the letter, uh that worked for me. Like because like, yeah. it, it was Woody Harrelson reading it to us, you know. Uh and I thought that worked really well. I I didn't so much like him when he was alive, but all three of those letters that the characters read in the movie, I think each and every one of those worked for me, especially the one to Francis McDormand. Um, yeah. When he talks, well, kind of play off the character's performance as to what's going on while they're reading them. Right. Or while the letter's being read. Yeah. But I also think that Woody Harrelson's performing those letters, you know I mean? He's like, he's reading it in voiceover. So like the part, whenever he's talking or not talking to, but whenever Francis McDormand is reading the letter and you hear Woody Harrelson talk about how, you know, I don't want you to think I didn't care about finding your daughter because I cared a lot. You know, and usually cases like this are solved a couple years down the road when someone with a loud mouth is talking to someone else with a loud mouth in a jail cell. And I really sincerely hope that happens to you. You know, like whenever he was saying that, uh, I found that to be very, very good. One thing that I'll say real quick, because uh, we've been kind of harping on the negative aspects of the movie. I want to bring up one of the things I really liked about the movie. And uh, there's two scenes in particular one from Francis McDormand and one from Sam Rockwell. The one where Francis McDormand is putting flowers out by the place where her daughter was raped. Uh, yeah. Next to the billboard. And the deer comes up. And uh, she starts talking to the deer. And she's like, you know, you're beautiful, but you ain't her, you know. And uh, I don't know. I thought the way she starts crying at the end of that scene as she's talking, it seems so real and so genuine and so... I don't know, just good, you know? It just felt good to see, like, and then... Yeah, I think Francis McDormand's <laughs> great in it. Yeah. I don't think there's any... Any doubt. <laughs> any other negative stuff about the movie aside, like, she's good in it. Sure, and then and then there's the scene where, as after Woody Harrelson is dead and Sam Rockwell's character just finds out about it and he walks across the street to the sign maker. Uh, and he, it's all that one shot where it follows him all the way across the street. He breaks the window... He walks up the stairs, he pulls out his gun, he, like, punches the dude in the face and throws him out the window, and he punches the girl, and, uh, you know, he goes across the street all in one shot, and uh, I think the character's name is Red, the the sign maker. Yeah, he's Red because yeah. he has red hair. Yeah, yeah, and he's, like, crawling on the ground, and he turns around, and he says, uh, see, Red, I got problems with white folks, too. Um, That was really menacing and scary, you know, and just... Like, my heart was racing during that shot because I was like, God, what, is, what are the repercussions of this? You know, and it turns out he just got fired and, and nothing else happened. But uh, when it was happening, I remember thinking, like, holy crap, this is Yeah, this I is think nuts. it's one of the most intense scenes in the movie. I think that's almost, like, the peak of, like, intenseness. Sure, and that and then I think the Maltov cocktail scenes could be argued to be pretty intense as well. Yeah, um... I do want to say that I think that that guy who plays red, like the, the realtor billboard owner mm-hmm. guy, um, that guy is amazing. He was also in get out. He was and, in get out. Wasn't he? Yeah. He's like the, the brother yeah. of the, like the, the white family yeah. and get out. And like, uh, based on those two movies, I love that guy. I think he's so good. He's actually like, because I have my issues with Sam Rockwell's character, like he's actually probably my favorite person in this movie to watch again. Like when I was trying, when I was rewatching it, yeah. like when he was on screen, I was so into it. You were there and then for like, it. yeah. And <laughs> I was like, I can, I can watch this whole movie again. And, uh, then, you know, I think the scene I actually stopped it on was, was like, 
uh, Francis McDormand and Woody Harrelson like sitting in like the swings when they're talking. Oh yeah. About like that's about thirty minutes, and I think, and, and but like I think that's the scene where I stopped it because I was like sitting there watching that scene, and it was a bit it was tough to get through that scene. <laughs> but that guy, and anyways, I just wanted to say that guy. I, I love him. I think he's great. I hope he does a lot more things. He's a really unique looking guy. No, definitely. Like very. I can. Like he's not going to yeah. pop up in some romance movie or rom com or anything like that. No, definitely as like not. A, as a lead, anyway. He, he reminds me of a a ready a Eddie Redmayne type, but with a more likable face. But yeah, I could watch that guy. Like, if, I mean, if he was, if this movie was more about him, I, I would probably like it more, just because. Yeah, man, if, he's just that kind if it of, were like, about like, the man who puts up the three uh, the three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri, it would be a more yeah. interesting movie to you. Yeah, but all in all, I would say it's it's a good movie, but I agree that it, it kind of sours in time. After uh, it doesn't hold up to to uh, scrutiny. No, I think. Um, well, I think we like you said we've been kind of negative on it. At least I have. <laughs> um, sure. But we can talk about some things that uh, were really good, like other than Francis McDormand, which we've already said. Uh, I actually did really like the scene with like the priest. Oh yeah, that scene's awesome. Like when she comes home and like she just tells off the priest. There's a lot of uh, those those kind of speeches that are in this movie, like where she tells off somebody. That's just like really satisfying because it's kind of one of those things. Like, man, I wish I could do that to like this ex person that I didn't like this one time. Oh right. Like I don't even know any priests in real life, but I wish I knew one that I didn't like so that I could uh <laughs> unload on him like Francis McDormand does. Yeah. And not really, um, I don't wanna I don't wanna be mean to priests. <laughs> no, I don't want to be mean to anybody. It's a, that's like I would never do that to anybody. I guess that's what's satisfying about them in some ways because I know I would I would never do that. Like not even just like I don't have the courage to but I just like generally don't operate that way. Right. Yeah. No, I understand that. I think I would do it in her circumstances, right? Like if I were doing something that I knew people didn't like and I knew what they were going to say before they even told it to me. And then someone who is in an organized religion whom apparently you have no uh, positive feelings towards decides to decides to come in and tell you what's what. I can see uh, losing your temper and being like, excuse you. Uh, yeah, your club sucks also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and going back to the, the Woody Harrelson letter, he said he did makes that comment of like someone with a big mouth runs, like runs their mouth too much. And that's how this case is solved. Mm-hmm. And we kind of almost get that right. Like <laughs> there's this guy who comes in, um, to Francis McDormand's restaurant and he basically like tough talks her and gets really weirdly like hostile with her and basically tells her like, I wish I had raped and and murdered your daughter, which I don't know about that scene. I felt a little weird about that. Right. It felt like, uh, an excuse for a menacing character, but the, there was no reason for him to be that menacing towards her. Like it, it seemed cartoonish. Yeah, I just yeah, exactly, and I just I I don't see the like the human reasoning like right. It's like even, I don't understand why he would do that. Yeah, like, I I I would never do what Sam Rockwell does when he like runs across the street and like beats the crap out of the red guy and like throws him out the window. I would never do that, but I understand why he did in the movie why he's doing it, and I don't have it with that guy. Right, like, that, that that scene. Yeah, it just seems like he's kind of a one note creep, and uh, yeah, like like let's say he is the killer rapist. Why would you go in there and say that to her? And yeah. I don't know. And, and like, even if you're not, why would you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, especially if you're not, why would you do that? But if you did, uh, why would you go in there like that about it? Even if you wanted to like brag, why would you be like, "I wish I did do it. Maybe I did. I don't know." Bye. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. It, and and he, <laughs> he comes back later with Sam Rockwell in the bar, right? And Sam Rockwell overhears him mm-hmm. talking about burning and raping someone, somebody. Um, and so that we can think we have this moment that Woody Harrelson was talking about. Like, right. Oh, it's just overheard. Like, it's it. And, this is happening. Yeah. And I remember when that was going on, I, I didn't like it, right? Like, did, do you think, like, let's say, well, first, let's say that, like, 
it ends up being that that, that guy didn't do it because he was over in Iraq at the time. Yeah. Right. Um, so it's definitely not that guy. He's talking about burning and um, raping someone else. Right. Which is obviously bad. But like if it had really been that guy and it had worked out just like Woody Harrelson had said, how would do you how would you have felt about that? I would have felt I don't I don't think I would have minded that so much. I think what would have made that scene at the end, the coincidence of it all work better for me is if the scene earlier in the movie with Francis McDormand and that guy hadn't been in there at all. So like if this was the first time we'd ever seen him and it was an indeterminable about a month later and Sam Rockwell was just in a bar overhearing it, he's lost his job, he's given up on the whole thing, but he's still feeling like a shitty guy because he didn't get to redeem himself yet. Um, if he had then heard someone in the bar whom we had never seen before over talking about lighting someone on fire and raping them, we would be even less sure, right? And when he calls her, we would be even less sure, you know? I think that would have been better. Yeah. and I mean, the thing is, like, even though we had that scene with him earlier, it, it is sort of like the almost like a, a deus ex machina solving your problem, right? Like the, the thing that just, it just comes in out of nowhere. Maybe, um, but, it, but did it solve their problem? Because by the, well, no, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, but you think it's going to, right, like it, okay. it, they, they lead you to believe that it is. Uh-huh. And because it doesn't, I think it works better as like a true deus ex machina, right? Like, a, um, and I guess I should explain what that is, but deus ex machina is essentially uh, something that, in a story like comes out of the blue and solves your character's problems that hasn't been established or talked about before. Right. Um, if you've ever seen adaptation with, uh, Nicholas Cage, Mm -hmm. they talk about deus ex machinas a lot. Um, but anyways, uh, it's not quite a true one because they established that guy previously by having him come in and do that scene with Francis McDormand. But if it doesn't end up being the right guy anyways, why not just go like full day of sex machina? And like, why even give that scene in there? You know, the, I, the one I basically with I agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Why give that scene yeah. of like establishing him first? Like let him just be a random guy in a bar yeah. because that's how this, the case, the cases work according to Woody Harrelson is it's just some random person for no reason. So like, right. I don't think you needed to establish him. I agree with you. Right. And then, and then also you can get rid of the problematic scene that just, feels like one of those tonal shifts that don't work right like uh that's an example i think of like the tone going all over the place right like this is not a movie where where like cartoonishly evil characters exist until they do in that one scene yeah and then and then he he just leaves the scene again and then we're back to maybe cartoonish characters but less menacing ones you know like he was just like dastardly you know what i mean he had like a, he like twirling his mustache and yeah he has everything everything short of that you're right yeah it just I was like, eh, okay that's a little on the nose and it feels like uh i don't know yeah it feels like maybe i don't know i think the i, I even think the ending works better without that scene right uh, yeah, I where th- Francis McDormand doesn't even has never even seen the yeah, person exactly. he's going after. Exactly. Like I think it works better if Francis McDormand is contemplating murdering a complete stranger at the end of the movie. You know what I mean? Like that's way more effective than like contemplating murdering the guy that is a shitty guy and she met before and like threw something at her because then it it kind of gives her like a justification maybe maybe not a justification for murder, but a justification for thinking he's a shitty guy, right? Uh, yeah. Whereas I think it, I think it would work better for the ending of the movie if she just had to take Sam Rockwell's word for it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, and I think it would work better in the sense because she'd be like more of like grasping for grasping at straws yeah. a little bit more, going down like starting down a path that we don't want her to go down, and we hope that she can pull herself out of it. You know, where yeah. which is like and, what the ending is, but I I think it would have been more powerful with what we're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I I agree. And I think, I mean, I think with the ending, that's kind of where we, we end off is like, they're both going to do it. Neither of them are sure they're going to do it when they get there. Um, But, you know, we end off on this, this point of like, 
everything has led up to like them in an even darker place <laughs> than like when the movie right. started. At least I, I felt like, uh, and that kind of goes to like the big thing, a theme of the movie that was like, uh, anger begets more anger, mm-hmm. which is, uh, that comes from John Hawks's character <laughs> kind of gives them that big speech after. Cause he like, you know, burns the billboards at one point. Yeah. I did like that joke in the movie where Peter Dinklage was like, she said begets. Yeah, the the dumb. He was like John Hawks says the the dumb girlfriend who we yeah. previously didn't like. I'm I'm actually I'm okay with her being in the movie for that one setup. Yeah, it's like she says anger begets it more anger, and everyone's just surprised that the dumb girl said begets. <laughs> You're right, and then it finds out she did say it, but it wasn't hers. She stole it. Yeah, <laughs> like, that was funny, but it, I think that's like I don't know the big big theme and, and takeaway. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, just. Uh when it becomes a big circle jerk of hate and anger, you know, that's all it's going to be. Yeah. And I think that that's very relevant to, you know, the point of what we're talking about with the, the movie being, um, relatable to what's going on now with like uh, anti-police protests and stuff. And it's like when anger comes into it and like it does, if, if, if protesters like riot and end up killing a cop, like, that's just more angered. And then the cops are just more angry, right? Like it, mm-hmm. it, it, it works really well. Like I, like I said, that's my favorite thing about this movie. Yeah. It's, it's a huge cycle. And I think this movie portrays that perfectly. Right. Cause yeah, one person says something and then it's just like another person wants to react to it. And it's all about like, if people just tempered their reactions a little bit, like you have the fat dentist who wants to get involved in this story and you have, I don't know, you know, so many characters who are angry or outspoken and, and like I said, like earlier, these billboards aren't even in their periphery. Like these people likely haven't even seen the billboards in person, you know, and and you have a dentist willing to like cause her pain <laughs> because he's just mad and he has the authority to uh, to use his anger. So, you know, it happens with the cops. It happens with the dentists in this movie. Yeah. So it happens everywhere. And I, I think that's one of the strong parts about the movie, too, which is like even some of the side characters tie into that theme really well. Yeah. It's, it's, it's nothing if not on theme. <laughs> yeah. Like the whole yeah. movie. <laughs> and, and that's probably the playwright in him. You know, I mean, a lot of this movie feels a little overwritten and I think, yeah. I think that comes just from the playwright background. I think a lot of playwrights that make movies probably suffer from that same thing. Um, I think this is a, a step up from his last movie, seven psychopaths. But yeah, I didn't see it's that a one. step down from In Bruges, which I think is still uh, fantastic. Yeah, I like In Bruges a lot. And it might that might be because you have Irish people in it with like his Irish sensibilities getting his humor. Yeah, I think <laughs> and, definitely. And I think, and, and I think coming this way, something gets lost in translation. And this goes going back to the Golden Globes conversation. Like, I think it probably read really well on paper. Like, I think the screenplay is probably good. Oh, definitely. Like, yeah. and just some of it got lost in translation and didn't quite work as well when it actually went from like paper to screen. I, I agree with that. It's a really ambitious movie with what it tries to do, especially uh, considering how many characters there are actually in it. I haven't seen the other like drama pictures, but like for for me, I'm hoping like, man, there's got to be a better movie than this out there. Oh, there is. I have to win best yeah. best drama. Yeah, I mean, I like this movie quite a bit. I like it more than you did. Um, but I was surprised even that this won best drama. Yeah, for sure. I didn't, did not see that coming. Um, but you know, overall there's some good things to like about it for sure. And there's, it's an interesting allegory, you know, for what's going on in our time. And I think mostly the flaws make me not want to watch it again. Obviously I couldn't, I couldn't get through it a second time. Sure. (laughs) Um, so that, that's kind of where I stand. Um, I don't know. Have you given your overall thoughts already? And basically, I don't know. If we're going with arbitrary ratings again, I'd give it a three and a half out of five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'd probably give it a three, a two and a half to three. Um, Ouch. But that's, yeah, that's pretty, it's probably pretty harsh, but I don't know, man. I just struggled that second time. Yeah. Well, fair's fair. Oh, well, you know, yeah, you gave it your, yeah. uh, you gave it your all one and a half times. Or That's one right. and a third uh, times. Yeah, one and a third, one and a quarter times, something like that. Whatever. All right. Uh, so 
let's move into our top three. Oh my. And, uh, we're staying on the three billboards theme with the top three. And, um, as long as we've known each other, we've both been big fans of Sam Rockwell. It's true. I remember when we were first hanging out watching movies together, you showed me some Sam Rockwell movies. and It's true. Uh, we're like, this guy's great. And you were right. Uh, so we're going to do our top three Sam Rockwell movies slash performances. This is exciting. So go first. Okay. I will start with number three being my least favorite Sam Rockwell performance, working into number one being my favorite. I have listed as number three... Duncan Jones's first uh, f- movie, Moon, and which Sam Rockwell is one of the only people in this movie, and he plays an astronaut who is alone on a space station by himself, waiting to be relieved from his long tour of uh, manning the space station by himself, and he's ready to go back home to his family, and man is he good in this movie uh yeah he he yeah. definitely carries the movie i mean there's no one else to carry it other than i think he's got like his wife and like maybe a baby son or something on a on a video phone on like a video screen yeah and then the voice of kevin spacey is like the robot talking to him but otherwise it's it's all sam brockwell oh yeah kevin spacey's voice was in that movie creepy yeah yeah um yeah i i liked moon i I had to watch it a second time because I don't know if you remember. We, w- we went and saw Moon together and I fell asleep. I did. I think we had actually saw – like I think that was our third or fourth movie seen in a movie theater that day. And we watched it at like 10 p.m. And I remember you yeah. fell asleep. I fell asleep for like 25 minutes and I woke up and was real confused because <laughs> <laughs> a lot happens in that movie. But I, I've since seen it a couple of times and, and it's, it's very good. Sam Rockwell's absolutely great in it. Yeah. All right, what's your number three? Number three, I guess I didn't do mine in any specific order, although I, I guess I should have. Oi. Uh, maybe I can just, I'll just think about it real quick. Just, yeah, edit it um, on the fly right now. Yeah, number three, um, it's probably three billboards. I think he's really good in it. As much as I didn't like this movie, <laughs> I think he's great in it. He is. Like like I said, I just, I love to watch him be unlikable. <laughs> you know, like I just love it. Because even when he is, he's not. Yeah, it's it's just an interesting, <laughs> interesting talent of his. And so I just, I thoroughly enjoyed everything with him. I think like, um, that as far as like his performance is like, he's funny, but kind of, even when he's being like a bad dude, like he's kind of funny and just has that, the sensibilities about him that, that just make me laugh, whether they, whether it's appropriate or inappropriate. He has a, he has a good confused and figuring stuff out face Yeah, that he puts on in this movie quite well. Does anyone play, confused better than sam rockwell i'm not sure yeah confused but trying to figure it out he nails it yeah yeah (laughs) okay so you're you're second okay so my second movie is the first starring role that i remember seeing sam rockwell and i almost said first role but then i remember i did see charlie's angels first and also teenage mutant ninja turtles first he's in that for just like a little bit but yeah anyway i'm i'm getting off point the second movie is Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. This is the George Clooney-directed movie about Chuck Berry, the host of The Gong Show, who claimed to have been a spy assassin for the CIA. And, uh, yeah, I think George Clooney, uh, this is one of his better movies that he's directed. And this is Sam Rockwell at, like, peak awesomeness. He gets to carry yeah, this the movie. is one of the first. Yeah, this is one of the first ones that you showed me. Like I remember, um, and I don't think I've seen it since then. I remember loving it and like falling in love with Sam Rockwell in it. But like, and I thought about like including it, but then I was like, you know what? I, I just remember really liking him in this one. Like I actually haven't seen it <laughs> long enough to talk about it. But yeah, I haven't seen it in a long time either. But I'm going to assume that Sam Rockwell is still really good in it. And I will not speak yeah. for the quality of the movie itself because I don't remember well enough to do that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's certainly a fair one. Like, I almost put it probably because of that. Like, it was the time that I fell in love with Sam Rockwell, and I was like, "This guy is amazing." Yeah, yeah. Right. And okay, so my number two is the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. Oh man, that was my dark horse. Which, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't. I know he's not a lot in the movie a lot, but. Um, this was early on too, like in, in us watching movies together. And I just remember him like being like this, like nervous laughing guy who's in the James gang. Mm-hmm. Hey, and, Casey like, Affleck's he, in that one too. 
Speaking, Casey Affleck is yeah, also. We in talked that. about him earlier, also. He's the coward Robert Ford. He is. But he, he breaks up these scenes. Like I remember these scenes have like like a lot of like slow paced attention, <laughs> and then Sam Rockwell just will he'll laugh like, and that's all he has to do, and mm-hmm. like uh, kind of like add to the tension at the same time, but also make you laugh. And like, I think that's a really hard thing to do. Yeah. Like we've, we've seen, like we've talked about three billboards, not working, you know, some like trying to blend humor with like suspense and, and dark stuff. And like, I, I think Sam Rockwell does it really well in, in both movies and it's impressive. Yeah, definitely. Well, on top of that, actually assassination of Justin James is also just a really good movie. Oh, definitely. And so, uh, Sam Rockwell, it's not starring him or anything, but like I think he's like a very important ingredient to what is a really great movie. So I think that justifies like a great Sam Rockwell performance. Definitely. So I'm wondering if you and I have the same number one Sam Rockwell performance. <laughs> I'm wondering the same thing, I, and I bet we do. I bet we do too. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and just say it. Sam Rockwell in Galaxy Quest. That's it. Yep. Nailed it. Yep. Yeah, I think it's almost an objective fact that that's the best Sam Rockwell performance as uh, yeah. as Guy, the crew member with no last name. Uh, yes, constantly worried about his own uh, <laughs> time left on the on the crew because he's, yeah, he's yeah, going to he, die. Yeah, he's like the anonymous crew member that's there to just die. Yeah, the red shirt. So that none of the main character. Yeah. That none of the main characters have to die, and then, yeah, then you find out his name's Guy because he doesn't even have like a real person's name yeah it's great he's just so much fun in this movie this is probably the movie that everyone would know sam rockwell from even if they didn't know it was sam rockwell at the time right like if you talk about galaxy quest most people can probably finish some of his more famous lines in that movie you know uh about not having a last name and that's the episode he died in and it's just he's just so much fun in that movie it's great yeah, I think the movie's a little underrated. Definitely and underrated, yeah. It's, uh, it deserves way more love than it gets. Like, it's true. It's so fun. And I'm sad that Alan Rickman died before they ever got the sequel off the ground because there were rumors of a sequel for for a long time. But now that Alan Rickman's gone, I almost would rather they not even do it because Alan Rickman was almost just as essential to that uh, movie working as Sam Rockwell was. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If not more. For sure. Did you ever hear the the story that uh, it was in, originally intended to be a rated R film, and then when they like tested it or like when they got the R film, R they decided they wanted it to be PG thirteen, so they like recut and redubbed a bunch of stuff to make it PG thirteen. Oh no, I didn't know that. Yeah, I I've heard that story a couple of times, and I've never actually like looked into that. I don't know how much like documentation there is of that, or if it's just one of those like rumored things. Interesting, but. They they say that if you like watch the film closely enough, you can tell like you can see that the actors are mouthing you can, swear words. You can see them though. mouthing "fuck" and stuff or something. Yeah, that they're clearly they're like, "Darn it!" <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Which I think is really interesting because the film works really well as a PG thirteen, and I can't imagine yeah. it being R at all. I remember I watched that movie whenever I was in middle school, and I thought this is delightful. And I watched yeah. it with the family several times over the years. Excellent. Yeah, it's a good sit. All right. Well. I guess that does it for this week's show. All right. Uh, as always, we want to thank you, the listener, for listening. We want to thank Jake Wagner Russell for doing our intro and outro music. If you want to hear more of his music, you can do so at soundcloud.com slash bopscotch. Uh, if you want to follow along with the podcast on what we're doing when our episodes come out, uh, you know, interact with us, you can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash casuallycriterionpodcast. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at casualcriterion, or you can just email us directly at casuallycriterion at gmail.com. Please go and review us on iTunes. Let us know what you think. Give us some feedback. You know, we want to make the show better. We want to make the show what, what the people want to hear as much as about what we want to talk about. Yeah, exactly. So if you have any ideas, suggestions, thoughts, feedback, critiques, uh, anything, you know, uh, send us a review. Send us a comment. Send us a message. Do it. And uh, yeah, next week... Uh, we're not going to have Chris again. He's he's still be he's still going to be out doing his play. So it'll be me and Mike back here talking about the seventh seal, Criterion Spy number eleven. Ooh la la! Uh, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, our first Ingmar Bergman movie. Looking forward to it. So yeah, uh, I guess uh, until then, I'll I'll talk to you later. 
All right, see you later.